Hello, I'm Dr. Drew, and I'm an anesthesiologist at the Credit Valley Hospital Trillium Health Partners. I'm here with Dr. Murray Farouk, a colleague. And today we want to share with you some top tips in making thoracic anesthesia stress-free. We'll begin with uh, how the general process that we and others do at other hospitals when doing thoracic anesthesia. We use only left-sided double lumen tubes. Uh, the principles here do not necessarily apply to uh, the use of bronchial blockers. We use left-sided double lumen tubes, and I think most people do this in modern practice now. The tube is initially positioned, or confirmed position is confirmed with the flexible bronchoscope. Uh, with the surgeon present, the, the surgeon wants to see the cuff securely within the left main stem bronchus. He doesn't want it too deep where it can obstruct inflow or outflow. Uh, from the lobes of the left lung. He also wants it not so deep that uh, outflow or inflow to the right main stem bronchus is blocked. If it's here, that's too deep. If it's here, that's too deep. He wants the, the, the distal cuff of the left double lumen tube here. When we place the uh, patient into lateral decubitus to position for the start of surgery, uh, we again reconfirm position with the surgeon present, correct position. The problem is, uh, one of the problems in thoracic anesthesia is with time, that tube can still migrate. In my experience, the tube will only migrate throughout the case in an outward direction. This is because of the positive pressures of ventilation. It could be because of surgical manipulation of the lung in difficult cases. It can be from the weight of the circuit pulling on the tube, it can be from swelling of the face or the tongue pushing the tube in an outward direction. So this brings us to the first tip, which leads into the second. Don't put too much air into that bronchial cuff. The reason being that if too much air is placed in that bronchial cuff, it will force the double lumen tube outwards. We don't want to be in this position here where the, double lumen, where the tip of the double lumen tube has moved entirely into the trachea. It may be very difficult to reposition the tube at this point. If the surgeon has been operating for a while, there, there may well be blood and secretions in the air where we would just spill over. The flexible bronchoscope may be next to useless in order to get it back into position. We can't just push it down anymore to get it back into position because the right main stem uh, leaves at a less acute angle than the left main stem, and also because it's larger, so the tendency if we just push down would be to push it down into the right side. The second reason we want the correct amount of uh, air, and only the minimal amount of air, is as this tube moves backwards, a leak will develop around the cuff if only the minimal amount of air has been put. And we will show in a few moments how little air, how little the cuff has to move into the carina for us to detect a leak. The air will leak around the cuff. In this case, we're doing uh, left lung surgery and uh, the right lung is being ventilated. So in this case, the positive pressure will leak around the cuff. It will not go, that small amount of air is not going to affect the lung being operated on. Instead, it will exit the path of least resistance. At the time we initiate one lung ventilation, most anesthesiologists simply open the cuff to atmosphere pressure. We, however, can measure uh, the amount of air that leaks out, and this gives us an early warning that the cuff is starting to herniate into the trachea. Air being ventilated into the right lung in this case is leaking around the cuff that is just beginning to herniate into the carina. It is exiting via the small red arrows, out the lumen of the tube, which is open to atmospheric pressure, or in our case, to a highly compliant bag, which identifies this leak. The way we detect this leak is by attaching a highly compliant bag to the lumen of the, uh, to the lung that we are operating on, the non-ventilated lung. So this is a neonatal uh, resuscitation bag found in our delivery suites. It has an oxygen inflow, 
It has a connection for the endotracheal tube. It has a highly compliant bag, which can fill at effectively very low pressures. There's also an adjustable pressure limiting valve here. This is the closed position, and this is the open position. So we have a separate means of ventilation, but we have a monitor to detect leaks. It can detect very small leaks early uh, when, when intervention is simple. We also, uh, in order to make this even easier, we attach some corrugated tubing to the, to the device. This allows us to place the device on the anesthesia machine near the oxygen flow meter. Here we're going to show how we test for the appropriate amount of air to place in the distal cuff to just create a seal. We just withdraw a little bit of air and the bag begins to move. We re-inject it and the bag stops moving. That's about all the air, just a very small amount. Here we're pulling back on the double lumen tube till we detect a leak. This leak is a little slow to occur, possibly because that uh, left lumen is blocked by kinking. There we go. We've got a little bit of a leak here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go down with a flexible bronchoscope and see where that distal cuff is situated. Here we go, we're in the, into the trachea, and there's the cuff just beginning to herniate out into the carina, and that's all we need to create a leak. Actually, it came back just a little bit more, uh, but it's a simple matter now of correcting it just by giving a gentle push inward and there we have it, back in position. Anesthesia. At the start of one lang anesthesia, before the chest has been entered and before the lung has deflated, there will be down, as, the, as we administer positive pressure ventilation, the lung being ventilated will push downwards. There will be a small contralateral upward movement uh, push, uh, pushing air out. And what we will see uh, in this, and we will show you this in a, in a few moments, we will see inflation and deflation of the bag with those ventilation movements. We don't always see this if there are a lot of secretions, if there's severe pulmonary disease, if there's a pre-existing pneumothorax or uh, hydrothorax or severe disease. Uh, we will not see, we may detect this minimally or not at all. But it's useful information to have because it confirms that the, the, the lungs are connected through the diaphragm and both, uh, both main stem bronchus, bronchi are open to the manipulations that we want, either to ventilate or deflate the lung. As soon as the surgeon enters the chest and there's any pneumothorax created, that motion ceases and the bag will collapse flat. Here we see the transition when the surgeon opens the chest. Initially, the bag is moving, uh, and in a second, that bag will stop moving as the surgeon enters the chest and the pneumothorax is created. There we have it. Then, during the procedure, as the surgeon is operating, perhaps an hour into the case, perhaps sooner, we might see, we might detect a leak as the cut, as the, the tube migrates slowly uh, out into the trachea. It's easy to correct at this stage. The third tip is uh, to make thoracic anesthesia easy is the time when it comes that the surgeon is asking us to test for the staple line or test for leaks in the lung. We already have attached to that lung uh, a means of delivering gentle positive pressure ventilation. What that means in practical terms is 
We don't have to adjust the ventilator settings. We don't have to move the clamp. Uh, we just simply turn the oxygen flow up, adjust the pressure limiting valve towards closed, and gently squeeze the bag. We have all the time in the world to inflate that lung. No alarms will be going off. Sometimes we have to do this four times within a 15 minute period. It's a much more elegant, uh, it's a much more elegant way to manage lung uh, inflation through testing. So I've just been asked by our surgeon to yeah. test the lung to reinflate. Normally with reinflation, we stop ventilation and have to set parameters. But this is very simple. I just use the bag and I test the lung. I'm going to inflate, I just inflate it. And I've got all the time in the world. No lungs are going to go off here. And I'm inflating the lung. And he's testing. Okay, I probably got about 20 centimeters of pressure there. I'm using my hands. There is a there is a manometer here. We could attach to a uh, should we want. I've got fresh gas flow up here at 10 meters a minute. There is a there is an inherent leak in this bag. It's designed for a neonatal circuit to prevent excessive pressure. How's it going there? So, no, I, I'm just ventilating very lightly with the bag. But as you can see, uh, normally what would be happening in this scenario would be the alarms would be ringing. I just have to check another area which I don't see. Do you want me to let the lung down again? Yeah. Okay, I'll go back to one lung. So I think that that's much simpler than switching ventilator settings in order to fill the lung. The technique of using a separate circuit to control inflations and deflations of the lung being operated on and to allow for continuously monitoring for leaks to detect malposition is not new. For example, in the past others have described the use of a separate vein circuit for the lung being operated on. The main advantage of use of the neonatal resuscitation bag is that it is readily available of low cost and takes no extra time. It can be readily applied to any operating room without additional equipment. Furthermore, the smaller neonatal resuscitation bag may be more sensitive to small leaks on visual inspection. We do not remove the device, the neonatal resuscitation bag, from uh, until the surgeon has placed the chest tube and is closing the chest and we are completely ready to go back to too long ventilation. Another advantage um, of this uh, setup is that we already have a, a mechanism to deliver low oxygen CPAP in the event that we have significant hypoxia that we want to correct. Uh, thank you very much for watching this uh, and please provide any comments we would be glad to respond. Thank you.